Good afternoon. It is 301 Wednesday, March 11th. This is the TDN Writers Room podcast presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News and racing fans. This is the first day of the rest of your life. And Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, has been working his tail off lately. Mm. Yes, Bill, you finally have a title. Yes. Which is great. <laughs> yes. I was going to say you, you are the Woodward and Bernstein oh, in, in this, in, of this uh, situation. Um, Jonathan Green, uh, general manager of DJ Stable and uh, always looking on the bright side. Brian DiNato, racing editor at the TDN and managing partner of Franklin Ave Equine. And I hope we have a bleep button because I think someone's probably going to swear, swear during this. Definitely. Oh, at yeah. least. <laughs> I mean, within the first couple of minutes, I would think so. The TDN Writers Room is presented by Keeneland, the home of world-class racing and industry-leading sales. The spring race meet begins Thursday, April 2nd, and Keeneland's next auction is the April 2-year-olds in training and Horses of Racing Age sale directly after opening weekend on April 7th. The 2-year-old catalog for the April sale is now available online. Another big week for Keeneland grads. We had Authentic in the San Felipe, King Guillermo in the Tampa Bay Derby, and Mischievous Alex in the Gotham. So a clean sweep there in the three-year-old preps, which we may or may not get to later. They also had She Dares the Devil in the Honey Bee, Donna Veloce in the Santa Isabel. Combatant was a Keeneland November purchase from the racehorse section last year. So that's the second straight week that one of those horses has won a big race. And then Starship Jubilee, who's a win machine in the Hillsboro, and Trophy Chaser gets his first stakes win in the Challenger. John. I know you're a big authentic fan. Absolutely. And and who wouldn't be after that tremendous win in the San Felipe? I mean, me personally, that was the most impressive three year old prep of the weekend. For sure. He just he really did all the hard work too. You know, I mean that pace was fast and, and he really buried his stable made thousand words and you know, when, when he faced that field in the sham, you didn't really know what was behind him. It's kind of an indictment of the field when he's shifting in and out and still winning by a ton. But that was that was the acid test this past weekend, and he looks like Bob Baffert's A team for sure. And no question. And he, uh, I think he posted like a 98 buyer, which was just super impressive, only topped by King Guillermo, who's another mm-hmm. Keeneland grad um, who had a 99 buyer. Yep. Yeah, King Guillermo, I feel like looking back at it, you kind of wonder how to let this horse go out 49 to 1. His PP's kind of looked interesting. After the fact, when he went and romped like that, but I thought he was pretty impressive, and it seemed like a legitimate, actual, real deal performance. And of course, we all want to know, or we have to tell people that he is owned by a former member of, of the Boston, Boston Red, Red Sox. Sox. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go Victor Martinez. Sure, there's a ton of Red Sox fans at Keeneland September yes. every year. So if you're tuning in and you're more of a casual racing fan slash listener, or if you're a diehard racing fan slash listener and you've been in a coma since Sunday, let's run down the gigantic news of the week, which is going to have longstanding implications in the weeks, months, even years ahead. So Monday, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York unsealed indictments against thoroughbred veterinarians and trainers, including Jason Service and Jorge Navarro in Manhattan. Jason Service just won the Saudi Cup a week and a half ago, and Jorge Navarro has has long been a really top trainer, particularly in Florida and New Jersey. And we're going to get to every single facet of this. It's going to be a very emotional day, I feel like, for a lot of us. And a lot of us, I think, feel feel vindicated because we, we talk about these issues basically every week about cheaters and racing and how they're allowed to get off scot-free. And I I just start with this, that it's like, it's funny that it's not funny. It's sad, but it's also funny that in this case, the big shock is not the scandal itself. The big shock is not that these guys were drugging horses and cheating. The big shock is that there were actually ever any consequences to come from it. And they feel like in most scandals in other sports, when something blows up like this, you're surprised at what was happening, the behavior that was going on. And this time it's like, oh my God, they finally got these guys. And Shout out to the FBI and the and the U.S. Attorney's Office because they did something that racing has had a chance to do for a long time, and and it has done a poor job of, which is policing itself. So I guess it was good that law enforcement had to come in and do racing's dirty work for it and and catch these guys. We should say everything everything is alleged. There is wide ranging doping allegations here, including creating, synthesizing, distributing uh, PEDs, customized PEDs. There's lots of vets involved. Um, um, Jorge Navarro and Jason Service are obviously the big names, but there were 27 people named in the indictment. And I think the overarching theme here is that this is a good day for racing because this is the trash being taken out. 
and this is sunlight. They say sunlight is the best disinfectant. This is a big ray of sunlight onto what has been a glaring problem for racing for a long, long time. And now it seems that there are finally going to be consequences. And going forward, there are ongoing investigations. And even if there aren't any more indictments coming, I think that this will act as a big deterrent going forward for people that they'll have to at least be more discreet about this kind of thing, if not stop it altogether. There are tons of angles to this. I'll open it to the floor. I'll start with Bill Finley, who has done a tremendous job this week. He's busted his ass and is clearly very tired. We appreciate him coming in and giving us his insights. Alan Carrasso also did a great job in the main story on, on Monday. Uh, Bill, what do you think? Well, just as an aside, I think everybody at the TDN ought to be very proud of the coverage that this uh, organization has done. I think uh, we've been out ahead of the pack and have done a terrific job. I have very similar reactions that you did, Joe. And I, I said to somebody, if, if they had come to me the day before this happened, said, I'm not going to tell you who, but two big trainers are going to be busted tomorrow for doping and juicing. Who do you think they are? My answer would have been Jason Service and Jorge Navarro. Uh, look, you know, we can say these things now, things that we weren't really allowed to say before, but everybody in this room was extremely suspicious of those two guys, as we are of many other trainers whose names have not come up in this. But did I think these two guys were on the up and up? Of course not. And I don't think anybody who really follows this sport and is not hopelessly naive felt otherwise. But I've been doing this long time, longer than you guys. I go back to the era of the greatest juicer that ever lived, Oscar Barrera, the Babe Ruth, the Michael Jordan of juicers, <laughs> and have seen this go on and on and on for decades. And I thought I'd go to my grave, never seen anybody get caught because it had been gone on for so long with so much anecdotal evidence and stuff where, you know, like Mark Cassie said, and we'll quote, to me, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, looks like a duck, et cetera, it's a duck. We know what was going on. Nobody ever got caught. And not only did nobody ever get caught, nobody ever shed any light on this. No assistant trainers ever ratted out, you know, at anybody, is disgruntled employees. I just thought it was going to be business as usual. So it was the most shocking in that respect, not who was involved, but that this happened was the most shocking story I have ever seen in my lifetime in horse racing, and don't expect to see anything more shocking. Mm -hmm. No, well said, Bill. And, and you know, you really have to take a step back when you get a story like this. And I can, I will never forget where I was on March 9th when I heard, you know, the first rumblings of this happening uh, early, you know, Monday morning. And I, I remember, you know, being a little kid and my grandfather would tell me stories about the Chicago Black Sox scandal. And, you know, my dad would tell me stories about um, Olympic athletes that had doped. And, you know, I'm not a New England Patriots fate, uh, you know, fan, but I can I'm sure that when they, you know, heard about some of the cheating that went on there, they were upset about it. And Bill, we're not even going to bring up the Boston Red Sox or the Houston Astros because it's not a baseball day today um, for once. <laughs> the first one, the first one in, in ever. And it just as, as a lifelong fan and as a lifelong person involved in the industry, um, it really shook me to the core. It, 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 it definitely upset me. Um, there are still times, you know, in the past couple of days where I've been, you know, absolutely emotional, um, and, and, and saddened because not that this happens in the horse industry and that in itself is a tragedy that these things happen to these animals and to these athletes that don't have a say in what's going on. Um, but, but it was almost sheer upsetness that it that it occurred and it shook me to the core and then there's this wave of relief like thank god this is actually happening and that this is actually gonna you know hopefully galvanize the industry because you know it's a sport that i've loved for 30 years and and some of my best friends um that i've had over the years have been because of this industry and some of the greatest achievements outside of you know getting married and, and having my kids were because of of you know things that went on in this industry and right now the industry is at a tremendous crossroads and it's really i don't want to sound you know over emotional when i say this but it, it's really, you know, evolve or perish at this point. There are so many issues that are at hand with, with the horse industry when it comes to medication and when it comes to training practices and, you know, some of these nefarious characters um, that, you know, that, that were recently indicted that you just have to sit there and say, who the hell is going to clean up this industry? Because obviously we can't self-police it anymore because we're really terrible at it. So for the FBI to come in, and I think, Joe, you mentioned this before, for the FBI to come in and actually do our dirty work and sweep out 
I'm hoping that it's not a one-off because we all sit around this table and every single conversation we have with other people who are lifers in this industry can point to a number of other trainers that, that maybe are in question. And Bill, you mentioned before about if somebody had asked you the day before, if there were two trainers um, that, that you would mention by name that would be indicted, I don't know if I would have come up with both of these guys. I probably would have come up with 10 or 12 other names that I suspect that you can look at the statistics and you can say, you know, maybe it's this guy, maybe it's that person, maybe it's this individual. But, you know, for it to be Jorge Navarro, not much of a surprise. For it to be Jason Service, I think for me personally, because I work with the Service family, John Service has a number of horses for us, and he is beyond reproach. John is about as honest and straightforward of a guy as there is in the industry. And, you know, so for Jason to be involved allegedly in something like this, that's part of the astonishment and, and, and the surprise for me. Um, but just to go back to the original point, which is I'm happy that it happened in the sense that it's going to shine a light on this industry and it is going to force people in the industry to do the right thing and do the right thing by the horses and do the right thing by the industry because otherwise we're going to die in the vine as an industry. Touching on the same thing and what you just said, John, I think this is obviously a watershed moment and I – Definitely had conflicting emotions. Part of me was happy, honestly, as someone, as a better and as a oh, manager of a small stable that's kind of trying to expand, you kind of long for this day when things are going to be, you know, you're going to actually be able to compete on an even playing field. But at the same time, I mean, I kind of feel like a, a patsy in all this, you know. We all knew it was going on, but, I mean, we still put money through the windows. We still raced against these horses and have, you know, competed against them. And I I hope, I, I to, to our uh, co-owners, I kind of told everybody, this will either be the final nail in the coffin or it'll be what saves racing. And I'm, I'm hoping it's the latter. Totally. And, you know, I, I honestly was surprised at my own reaction on Monday that I was, I was giddy. Like I, it, I felt like I was on a natural high all day when I got this news because you just become so resigned to the idea that there are people that are cheating and drugging horses and killing horses in racing and no consequences are ever going to come from it. That's a part, that's a part of you that is, I guess I didn't realize is so ingrained, such a depressing thing that's so ingrained in me as a racing fan that I couldn't believe how happy I was when I heard this news. And it's like, it says a lot about the like inert fog that racing has been in when it comes to this issue that I was so giddy. And I'm, I'm not the only one. I most people were happy about it. I mean, usually in a sport, if, if the FBI comes in and busts 27 people in your sport, including some <laughs> of the biggest names in yep. the game, yep. that's bad news. Yep. But in this case, the fact that there were finally some consequences for this behavior felt like a gift from above. And so I guess that's not good, but it is good if indeed this is the turning point. It has the potential to be whether it take whatever it takes to clean up this sport, whether it's law enforcement should be seen as tremendous progress. And I think you guys are 100 percent right that this this is a crossroads. This is a chance for racing to finally admit to itself how much dirty crap it has allowed to fester in this game for so long. Or it can just brush it under the rug and go on as business as usual. So I, 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 I hope for the best, but I, I'm going to have to see it first. You know, again, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, we're talking about the story today, but an even more important story is what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And I do think that the effort to catch people will intensify now. And it has to, just like, you know, Brian said, if it doesn't, you know, we're all going to be working at Walmart in 10 years from now. Um, or maybe McDonald's. Or I'd be, rather work at Walmart. They all be dead at coronavirus. Okay. So why not manage? <laughs> Jeez, this is a cheer, cheery oh subject God. here today. But I just wonder, so he, here's my thought du jour, and I kind of go back and forth every single day, that horse racing had, you know, 100 years to solve this problem and got nothing done absolutely zero done other than a banamine positive on a 6% train or some poor guy gets fined, you know, and, 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 and given seven days. Now, the feds came in and did what racing couldn't do, but they're going to be gone soon. I mean, we hear there's going to be some more people coming out and, and some more arrests and suspensions, but this is nickel and dime stuff to the federal government and the FBI. They don't give a rat's you know what about horse racing. I'm shocked they got involved yeah. to begin with. Well, you know, well, they said they got involved yeah, they for said a they different got involved reason. Because they were looking at something else. And right. we don't know what that is. But they're they're going to pack their bags and they're going to go on to, to things that really matter a lot more than to society. Does racing have the capability 
of cleaning itself up. And let's hope so. But what evidence is there that the sport actually can do it? I don't know. Go ahead, Brian. I think a big takeaway from this is that surveillance is really what catches these guys. I agree. Great, yes. Way more than the testing. Rick Arthur I mean, made that point. Right. Everyone knew that, you know, whatever these guys were using was allegedly was beyond what we could test for. Yeah, let me, let me just interrupt. I mean, these guys were alleged, allegedly, again, doped thousands of horses, right. and there wasn't one bad one test. Right. One positive on any of them. But yeah. apparently none, none of them had ever watched a mafia movie or right. The Wire or anything, yeah. <laughs> and they're texting each other, I need more drugs. I, I think, that, I think they, just, they just couldn't help themselves. Well, I, I, love, mean, I love when they're talking for several minutes, and then Navarro's like, we shouldn't talk about yeah. this on the phone. You were already <laughs> talking about it on the phone. Oh, right, God. so I think that's, I mean... I don't know. You obviously can't just not test and give up on testing, but I think surveillance goes a long way and, you know, and self-policing. And I don't know, maybe people will be a little more brave, feel a little more brave and like they can actually call somebody out and they don't have, it doesn't have to just be this unspoken thing that we all know, but we don't actually say out loud. And one of the things that, that keeps coming up in more in the Twitter sphere than anything else um, is, you know, the owner should have known. And Brian, you're an owner as well. And, and the owner should have known, they should have known, they should have known. Um, and we can debate that till the cows come home, whether or not, you know, whether or not any of the owners should have known that, you know, that illegal medications were being utilized on their horses or not. You can say they had their head in the sand. You can say that they're absentee owners, however you want to play, play it. People are calling for everything from a tip to tail kind of tip to tail kind of, um, you know, scoping and reviewing of the horses. And like Brian said before, the tests aren't going to show anything. So why, why is that, you know, need to be the, the, the benchmark of it all, What should be the benchmark is when you have the opportunity as an owner to hire a trainer to handle your investment and your athlete, why are you going back to the guys that, you know, have shady reputations? Well, probably because they have a 28% win percentage. I mean, I'm glad you brought up the owners because I have a lot to say about this. But just to, to start off, it's it's absurd. It's just absurd that the average racing fan, even paying casual attention to the sport, can see something not right going on when trainers are regularly claiming horses and turning them into completely new animals. But the owners, the ones paying those trainers' bills, are acting like they're blind to it. Like, it's garbage. And you should be embarrassed, honestly, to act like you had no idea what was going on. I understand you don't want to implicate yourself legally but take some goddamn responsibility you're happy to take the glory when these guys win you graded stakes and owners titles cheesing in the winner circle but now you want to pretend like you had no clue what was contributing to it it's a complete farce and to me it shows you how many phony people there are in this game because it's all good to them until the shit hits the fan and then it's easy it's so easy right now to throw guys like navarro and service under the bus and who cares go ahead throw them under the bus i hope they put them under the jail i hope they never let them out but for you to see Suggest. You, know, you hire these guys for a reason. This is a sport where it's an accomplishment to win 15% of your races, and these guys are winning at 30 plus percent, and you're gonna act like you didn't know they were taking an edge. Do not insult the intelligence of the betting public and the racing fans to suggest you had no idea what was going on. Maybe you didn't know the exact specifics of what was happening. That's your plausible deniability to but to pretend like you're blindsided by this, it's completely not credible. And it's it's honestly saying nothing. Thing. I'd rather you say nothing than say that and insult all of our intelligence. Well, that goes back to one point I was making earlier. Are things really going to change? Now, it'd be very interesting to see. Let's let's put names in a hat and pick out, you know, among the, the, the us, the next 10 guys that we suspect, but you can't say it. What will their winning percentages start to be? Are they going to get scared and not go out there and do their dirty tricks? Or is it just going to be business as usual? And as long as there's the guy out there that's winning 31%, 29%, and he's getting all the owners, or the poor guy who's trying to play the game honestly and is winning 12%, you know, is starving to death, will it just be more of the same as things go on? And, and I agree with what, what John said. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to go over every single trainer. And, you know, at this point, it's a little bit like baseball. Who is on steroids? Who's not on steroids? It's very difficult to say. There's, I mean, there's some people that are more obvious than others. Uh, you just scribbled down a name of a trainer that I don't think cheats. And you said, this guy cheats, and you scribbled it down. But, you know, is it just going to yeah, be... Down, I wrote down Navarro. Right. <laughs> is it just going to be these owners just finding the latest magician uh, who's going to take their 12-5 claimer and win a great, stake, great three stakes race with it someday? Well, I think a couple points here. I think at best, um, some of these owners were just willfully ignorant. 
I mean, maybe you don't you don't want to believe your trainer when people are handing you trophies and writing you checks and handing you Eclipse awards and telling you how great you are and and how great your team is. You probably don't want to ask questions. When I mean, when you're winning, you're not going to ask questions. I think another aspect is I'm not sure that owners of these kind of trainers are getting are actually paying these vet bills. I don't think they're getting. I think trainers are paying them themselves for. But, some of this but stuff. they're paying the trainers, though. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, still, yeah. no, right? But maybe they don't see that part. And then I'm not defending. Believe me, I mean, every two dollar better on the planet. Every time a Jason Service horse wins, it says juice this, whatever you know. Everybody knows, and supposedly the smartest guys in the room had no idea. Obviously, that's completely ridiculous. Yeah. Um, another aspect of this, I, I, I think it's really interesting to, the conversation to talk about win percentage. What is a natural win percentage? Obviously, a lot goes into this. It's not a hard and fast rule. I looked on Equibase at 2019 statistics, five trainers who made 50 starts or more last year and won at 25% or better. Then I looked up the list of Hall of Famers, and you look at their lifetime win percentages, and they're not 25% or better. I mean, it's clear that it's rampant, and then there are a lot of guys who are doing it. I'm sure not every single trainer who won it 25% or more last year was was probably doing that, but, I mean, there are a ton of them. And when you look at the Hall of Famers, I mean, you know, Bob Baffert, Pletcher, the guys who get the absolute best horses, Baffert's a 23% lifetime trainer, Pletcher's 23%. I mean, you have guys, you know, Carl Nasker was a 13% lifetime Packs. trainer. They're all right. Packs. And saying, Mark Cassie, I mean, he's a 16% lifetime trainer, and he's, the value of it, the bloodstock that he's gotten in the last – X number of years is a lot higher than Jorge Navarro's. Yeah. I mean, t- and to that point that you guys are talking about, I guarantee you some of these owners are just waiting for this to blow over so they can find the newest up and coming juicer to give their horses to. Because honestly, people with that little integrity are not, they're not capable of the introspection to actually look at themselves, especially really rich people who are constantly being told yes by everybody in their lives. They're not capable of the introspection to be like, am I doing something wrong? Am I contributing to this problem? Maybe I should do something differently. Maybe some will do that. I guarantee to you a ton of them are just waiting for this to blow over so they can find the next cheater to keep them winning at 25 percent up well that brings up something that a lot of people have mentioned does this sport need to start suspending owners now if joe juicer gets caught doing something and you have 10 horses with him should there be some ramifications of some sort of suspension? Now, you know, you could be completely uh, not guilty, innocent, and have no, no idea what's going on. But, you know, as long as the owners are not uh, held responsible for the actions of their trainers, they have every incentive in the world to just go from, you know, juice guy to juice guy to juice guy to juice guy. Again, not can't name names, but there are many owners and guys that have nothing to do with this particular scandal that we've seen doing this, they just go from the hot juice guy to the next hot juice guy to the next hot juice guy to the next hot juice guy. And then I I would say that I've seen a little bit of people who employ other guys who you might have not have written written down in the paper or not, who might be in trouble in the future of this kind of thing. I've seen owners that employ those guys trying to dunk on the owners and the trainers who are embroiled in this scandal right now. So you better you better have your house in order. You better make sure that your guy is on the up and up, because if more does come of this, you're going to be looking just as bad as them. So I would I would lay low if you're employing a 25 plus percent trainer and you're not a hundred percent sure that everything they're doing is clean i might i might keep my mouth shut and not tweet i had an interesting kind of connection to this whole thing uh, our vet in new york was one of the vets indicted and nobody on the planet would accuse our trainer in new york of cheating but i mean we had the conversation about it after the fact i i mean i asked her point blank like i i said to her i can't imagine that he was we were getting this treatment but i just wanted to confirm that and i think that's kind of a duty of all owners, probably. For sure. And yeah, like like we were saying, like this is at best, they're guilty of gross negligence. And that stuff has got to stop. That's that's the best thing you could say about some of these people. Another thing we were talking about earlier, I think it's worth mentioning, is that, you know, we knew this was going on, but we didn't know how. We didn't know what what the methods were. And that was, was another thing that was so fascinating to me. It's like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, this Pandora's box opens and you go, oh, now I get it. But did anybody in their wildest dreams ever think that Navarro and Service 
were like cooperating with one another and this thing. That was what another thing that really blew my mind. You know, we, we hear these legendary tales of these claiming trainers, you know, these ruthless battles and claiming off one another and bitter rivals and everything. These guys, again, you know, it's called partners in crime for mm -hmm. a reason. And, you know, they were texting each other back and forth, warning each other about, oh, I hear investigators coming by. And, you know, I tried this drug and it really worked. You ought to try it. too. that was wild. Mm -hmm. right? And how about for two of the biggest claiming outfits in the country? They did not claim off each other since 2012. Right. Wow. Yeah, that was posted in 2012. Yep. They claim off everybody. I mean, oh everyone's free God. game, you know, whether you think you have a relationship with them or not. So the fact that they haven't claimed off each other in almost 10 years just is crazy. Um, I thought it was interesting also that what the charges were – um, weren't necessarily for juicing horses, but it was actually for mis I'm gonna I'm gonna misquote this, so so please jump in. But it was like misbranding and um, adulterating medications to deceive. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't anything about fixing races or about anything like that. It was it was all based on the on on the drugs themselves. Um, and I think it's it's tantamount to like when they arrested Al Capone. Um, you know, all those years ago when Bill was a kid and, and basically, <laughs> you know, it couldn't be for gambling or for larceny or for murder. They got him on tax evasion. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that, that was similar here as well. And I'm just going to read one more, one more quote, um, or one more piece of information that that's actually from, uh, the Pew Research Center in, in 2018, they said that 90% of the 80,000 people who were charged with, um, federal indictments pleaded guilty. 8% of the charges were dismissed and 2% went to trial. And of the 2% that went to trial, there was an 83% conviction rate. So they go, yeah, these, these guys ain't stupid. I mean, yeah. they're, they're going after, they're going, they're, they're charging people with the right charges and they're charging them with things that'll stick. And it may not necessarily be for what the four of us or, or other people would think, you know, would, would be tantamount to, to arresting all these people, but they're, they're going with the charges that they know are going to stick. Mm -hmm. Um, and that are going to, you know, hopefully put an end to, uh, to this kind of situation. Well, I think part of the reason is there's no such crime as Choosing a racehorse, you know, right. find that in some legal manual somewhere. So that's part of it. And you also hit the nail on the head from what I've, uh, people have explained to me. They are going after them on a charge that they know they'll probably have no problem getting to stick whatsoever. Um, though it is, it's not really tantamount to what we're talking about. It's basically taking a drug and changing the label on it. So you take it, you know, uh, monkey or red acid and put, you know, like bare aspirin on the, on the, uh, uh, on the label of that thing. But the one thing about it, you know, if people right now are looking for vengeance and want these guys to go away forever in life and everything, they're not going to spend a lot of time in jail. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just taking a wild guess, maybe a year and then if even that, maybe six months type of thing, because, you know, they're saying it, it's up to five years. And when they say it's up to five years, it all is really in reality, nine months or a year or something like that. So now I would say this much, though, um, though, I, I do think they won't go to jail for a long time. I am 100 percent certain that Jason Service, Jorge Navarro, and the three or four other trainers involved in this will never, ever again participate in thoroughbred racing in any way, shape, or form. Do, does anybody doubt me on that? The only thing I would say is that, you know, they could come back as a bloodstock agent or a jockey agent because hmm. those are things you don't have to be licensed for, and they're still in the industry. That's the only thing, though, Bill. I mean, I agree with you a thousand percent. They're not going to be in a position of power. They're not going to be in a position where they can train horses, they can own horses, they can even step foot on the racetracks anymore. Um, but there are other ancillary because there I, are there are other people. I, I see what you're saying, John, but I, I think the inability to step foot on the racetrack would probably, pretty much preclude them from, from doing those well, jobs. They, to, they can go to sales, though. They uh, can go to sales and represent Keelan, people. Wasn't it part of the statement from Keeneland or somebody said that they can't participate in any in, in racing? For Keeneland. Yeah, uh, I, maybe, was, maybe I'm I misquoting mean, I, I know it. I know what you're saying. I just <laughs> don't, I don't, I don't see it happening. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, I don't think they can man the, the hot dog stand on the second floor. I really I, I really, I hope I hope that you're right. I hope that the, if they're found guilty that that's definitely the case. But I've seen too many people walking around those unlicensed situations. And you go, wasn't that person ruled off? Mm -hmm. Didn't that person mm -hmm. have the worst rec reputation? All, you know, didn't that person get fired from this position? Because, and all of a sudden they're, they're signing tickets for, you know, $200,000, $500,000, um, you know, usually for Franklin. Um, you know, the, the, I was going to say, maybe that's, maybe right, I need to commit yeah. some crimes. We're going to bet so a Mookie, actually Betts, buy some Mookie nice Betts bobblehead doll that neither guy will ever step foot in a race. Famous Los Angeles Dodger okay. Mookie yes. Betts. Yeah. Okay. okay. Think, and the timeline's forever? Waiting. Yeah, forever. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> I think one thing we haven't really touched on is the, the betting aspect. I mean, yeah. bettors have been deceived for years. I mean, the one thing I'll say is it's kind of been priced in. I mean, Jorge Navarro is, it, I always, I remember there was, Andy Byer has, has said a lot about this for years. Um, not Navarro specifically, but 
the super trainers as he calls them. And his whole thing was, it doesn't matter what they're doing. We know, we know what the stats are. We know what's going on. You know, we need to take that part out of it. But I mean, and in a way it's kind of been priced into the market and, you know, people know that Navarro moves horses up 30 lengths. So they bet accordingly. Um, but man, I mean, a lot of people, it's cost a lot of people a lot of money. It can't have helped anyone's ROI betting the races and dealing with this. And I feel like the thing I always do is, you know, from a moral standpoint, it's like, well, I'm going to toss this. Like, I know this horse is, you know, this guy's a little shady, so I don't want to, I'm going to play against that horse. And it's going to be the one time where, you know, he makes <laughs> and it never works yeah. out. No, I mean, that that's, to me, you're right, that that's kind of an underreported part of this. And another part of it is the trainers that are getting squeezed out of the game. We're going to talk to Tom Morley a little bit later. We wanted to have him on as like a young guy who's trying to establish himself in the game. And even if I've, I've seen owners take horses away from smaller trainers and give them to Jorge Navarro and Jason Service and other guys. But even if it's not direct like that, they're losing market share to these guys that are cheating as they're trying to do the right thing. So these guys had a lot had a lot of ne negative effects across the industry, whether it's other trainers, whether it's other owners who are going out of business. And like you said, better is like, for me, the, the, the bigger implication for me was I always had to use these horses. I, right. These tickets got more expensive. Mm -hmm. I always had, like, it should not be the case that you look at a trainer claiming off of another trainer and sometimes off of really good trainers, like not guys who don't know what they're doing. And you automatically have to respect and use that horse because you're not sure what they're injecting them with. And it was just, it was such a baked in part of the game. And it'll continue to be it just maybe a little bit less so mm -hmm. it's such a baked in part of being a horse player and you just get used to it and then you realize once there's finally some consequences for it like this is sick this is sick that we're just accepted that we've just accepted this for so long yeah i mean shed no tears for the betters i mean on the surface you could say this is terrible but we know it's not because every better in the world factored it into their handicap and just like you said brian i mean okay this horse ran seventh for twelve thousand five hundred. he's claimed by this guy and now he's in for 20 and he's eight to five yeah let me you know let me step up to the windows right now it's the owners and trainers who played the game honestly who are the real victims here it is the tom morley's of the world and even high profile guys like a mark cassie who told me earlier in the week you know how many millions of dollars have been stolen from me and my owners in purse money over the many years i've been doing this by these guys and you know we have an owner crisis in this sport right now there's not nearly enough owners I mean, I've I've owned one five thousand dollar claimer once in my life, and you know I'm not uh, John Green. You know I'm, I'm not on the Fortune five hundred list. I can't go out <laughs> and spend ten million dollars on yearlings, but I wouldn't dream of ever getting involved in the sport as an owner because I always said you have two choices. If you if you you can either play it safe and be honest, it's not playing it safe. It's the right thing to do, and get your head handed to you, or you can cheat. And neither one is a particularly <laughs> inviting uh, possibility to me. I'm not going to cheat if I would hypothetically ever be an owner. And I don't want to go out there and get pounded by the Navarros and services of the world. I have one more betting point, and then I want to respond okay. to that. Uh, and you had actually written a story a few years ago about Forenze Fire when he won the Dwyer. Right. And when a crazy amount of money came in on him late. It's hard to not wonder if, you know, people connected point, to these yeah. people were betting a lot of money and making money that way. It wasn't just the purse money. And Manipulating the, the pools, basically. Right, and, you know, cashing in on horses they knew were on the devil or whatever these things were called. Yeah. Um, back to the owner thing. I had an owner, uh, you know, someone in on a couple of our horses, text me on Saturday and, and said, not in, a, not in a mean way, but say said, uh, why, what are these, to, talking about a specific outfit, what do these guys do that we don't do? And I pretty much had to say to him, well, they've got a lot more money and chances are they cheat. And, I mean, that's the tough thing about being an owner and actually trying to play the game the, the right way. It's something we constantly have to navigate. I mean, when we're looking at claims, you know, every time you look at a claim, you have to think, well, I mean, do we want to claim off of this guy? And if you don't, if you, if you can't claim off everyone you wonder about, you're not left with much to even go after. Well, and that's another way that they can dominate the game is they can even even the horses that are sound, they can plummet these horses in class because they know people are terrified to claim off them right. because these people know that they're not going to be getting the same horse once it comes into their barn. So that's how they get all the stock, too. And I think it's always interesting to see who and who claims off of those guys. And the other part of the of the sport that this is going to impact, uh, gentlemen, is what about the breeding game? 
uh, you know, you have, um, you know, a maximum security, you have uh, XY Jet, you have these horses that are winning million dollar races. And I know XY Jet passed away and he was a gelding, but we're going to get to him. Okay, good. Yeah. And his, but his, he, he does impact a pedigree and he does, you know, show that his stallion, you know, was, was a, a horse that can produce, you know, great sprinters and, and should be, you know, raised in stud fee and things like that. And, and not that anyone's going to lose any sleep. Um, or shed a tear for, you know, Windstar, China, Horse, and Starlight Racing, who combined to own Improbable. But Improbable ran, you know, in the Derby and ran fifth. And there was a DQ, and he moved up to fourth. Well, you know, if if it was an even playing field, and he maybe finished third instead, how much more valuable is that horse as a stallion prospect? Is the family, you know, and, and, and it kind of, you know, again, reverberates from there. It's, it's, it's the ripple effect of how is it going to, you know, how is it going to benefit the industry. I've seen people that have, you know, been shouting to the, the from the rooftops. If these horses get DQ'd, then I want to have the money. I want to have the title. And horse racing isn't going to do that. They're not going to go retroactively and start changing results and changing, um, you know, black type in, in in pedigrees and things like that. But I think that that it still needs to be mentioned um, that it's not just the betting public which it affects greatly. It's not just the racing horses which it affects greatly. But there's so much more money in the breeding aspect of this industry um, that there's probably you know a million dollars for every ten thousand. Um, um, you know, for every ten thousand dollar claimer that that that's claimed, there's probably a million dollar effect that this is going to you know reverberate throughout the breeding industry. Yeah, I mean, I think if there was an actual like a true stock market for stallions, you would have the real stock market was plummeting on Monday too. But I think a couple horses who knew, you know, <laughs> a couple horses would have you know maybe unfairly so. But I mean, that, that's certainly part of this. And I you know I can think of at least one horse that we own who the dam of is stakes placed. And I'm pretty sure it was, you know, off the claim and it was some high percentage guy. And it's like, you know, I guess it looks good on the pedigree page, but you, you kind of wonder. Well, and then you have to you have to consider whether or not these are horses that are just naturally unsound that are being artificially pumped up to race. And then you're passing those bloodlines along like that's that could be a major problem, too. And I that's like that's the main thing. And like if anybody is still listening that doesn't like really know racing. That's that's the, the biggest part of this that you need to know is that what these drugs did is it made horses run through pain and run through, you know, infirmities and, and run through stuff that should have had them on a pasture somewhere. And it leads to more horses breaking down and dying. And it's it's so outrageous because it's already a dangerous sport. And we've seen that. We've seen that in the past year of the chickens coming home to roost for racing that. Yeah, horses are going to die sometimes in racing. It's a tragic thing every time it happens. But to me, that just underscores the point that you can't let cheaters into the game as well to make it even more dangerous. That, to me, is the big takeaway here. And we're going to get to XY Jet, who's just the most high-profile example of horses that were broken down because of these guys. But it's... That's the that's the big immoral thing going on here. There's tons of immorality in this indictment. That's the biggest part. And, and just to stay on that topic, when the FBI had their um, press conference, they talked about four things that these medications did. And I think everyone around this table would say, wow, if there was something natural that did one of these four things, I would love to do it. But they're, they're you know implicating saying that the medications and stimulants that these horses were on stimulated endurance – deadened nerves, increased oxygen intake, and reduced inflammation. Any of those four would make a horse better, but all four of those combined, um, if these, you know, if these supplements did it, would make horses run like super horses. And, and, and then ultimately, you know, when you, when you bring in the fact that maybe they were on clenbuterol or other, you know, um, muscle building um, medications, um, that's going to make them more asound, uh, unsound. It is absolutely a shock to me that more horses weren't breaking down mm -hmm. um and and they weren't under this torque and under the the kind of pressure that that they would um you know endure the thing that i thought was was also interesting from the fbi short press conference was when they had they read their statements and then they said we're going to open up to questions what do you think the first question was by the by the press the first question i'll, I'll answer that how was this going on for so long? That would yeah, be you, you, you think how are we going? Why? Why? Why is it only twenty-seven people? No, the first question was how many deaths were as a direct result okay. of this. So the public perception of this industry is still we're killing horses, mm -hmm. and this is still going to go ahead and and encourage that kind of you know that kind of uh, you know death and and destruction to our athletes that don't have a say in this. So right. to me, it was it was just a telling. 
in a day of very you know telling statements that 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 we learned throughout you know throughout the the course of the past uh, 48 hours or so to me you know you get an indication of what the public perception is based on what questions the press Mm -hmm. are asking and all of us would have asked very different questions but the fact that they said how many deaths were a direct result of this shows that people in the, in the average person still thinks that we're abusing and killing these horses. Well, you can't actually put at least one number on it. And as, you know, as awful as this whole thing was, there was one particular a part of it that was, you, you know, make you actually, you know, want to hurl, was the conversation they intercepted between this harness guy, Nick Surik, and the trainer, Tenuzo, yep. about how he had basically killed six Navarro horses is a means to cover up. I, I guess he didn't want any necropsies done on them, or you know, it was not really clear exactly the the how and why and and etc. But he basically came out and said, you know, I took care of six of these horses for this sob, and you know, you know what would have happened to him? You know, bleep bleep bleep. Mm-hmm. I mean, can you? I mean, we're talking a lot about the greed involved in this. How about the abject cruelty mm-hmm. to the animal? And you got this just you know. Ugh, horrible human being talking about disposing and killing of six of Navarro's horses and bragging about, you know, what a hot shot he is because, you know, he cleaned up the mess. Just, I mean, disgusting. I think that's the worst part for the general public that, that they find most offensive. I mean, if one rich guy won the race over another rich guy, yeah. big deal. But, you know, the, the people who, can, you know, the animals that can't speak up in this and that are being abused for this is obviously, I think, for the general public, the most offensive part of it. And I think that's honestly like why we, we talk about cheaters I think on this show. And that's why it was so liberating to be able to finally name these two jerks. And I, it's people talk a lot about what they can do to make racing safer. Oh, let's get rid of Lasix. Let's make their training. Let's make the track safer. Let's alter training. Like, Get rid of these guys. Get these guys out of here. To me, that's the biggest thing you can do to make racing safer and to break down fewer horses is to smoke these guys out and ban them for life. And there's tons more. And I hope that there are more indictments coming for these people because that's the unspoken thing. And I appreciate all the other steps that are being taken to make racing safer. I think any step to you know create a safer surface, drugs, whatever, that's great. This is the unspoken thing among racing officials and racing decision makers, because honestly, like a lot of them employ these guys, or if they don't employ these guys, they employ people who are associated with these guys, or they're friends with the owners who employ these guys. Everybody's got their hands in this, and it just, that's why nothing gets done. We, we ha- you have to wash your hands of these people. And I'm not saying you're going to catch every single guy, obviously. There's always going to be guys who are beating the test and ahead of the, you know, you're not going to catch every guy. But this is the biggest thing you can do to improve the safety of racing is to get rid of these guys for life. And I think part of, kind of you touched on it, part of what's so frustrating is, I mean, we all are kind of complicit in this and we all kind of let it go on. But nobody wants to be the person to... I mean, most of us don't, aren't in the power to stand up and be the ones to change things. But we're we trying all, to speak truth to power right, here. Like we've That's already what we're doing. seen it. Yeah, I mean, it's just frustrating in that way. And I said to you today, I don't know if racing deserves to be saved. And you thought that was a little harsh. But no, I, I feel I like mean, that sometimes too. You know, it's just, we've all known for years, so many people, you know. Right. At least now something's going to happen. No, I, I, something that's going to happen, and, and I know Brian again. Not not that not that DJ Stable is the be all and end all. I'm not saying that, but but we we are you know an influential operation, and and we announced earlier this year that we're not buying two year olds at the at two year old training sales because at the time there there were still un, we thought there were still unsafe um, you know um, conditions with horses that still could be medicated that were still um, breezing on on race tracks you know faster than they should be, and we made that announcement, and I'm glad to see that some of the the, if not all of the two-year-old um, auction houses have opted to, you know, change and modify their, their medication rules. Now, they haven't done it enough for us to still want to dip our hand and buy a horse at a two-year-old sale, but that's the only way you're going to be able to do it is if you have people like like us on the podcast that, that have a big audience that can talk to people and influence them, at least get them thinking in that direction, and then some of the bigger outfits, owners, and users that need to take a stand and say, I'm not going to employ you know, any of these guys that cheat, I'm not going to change my horses to any guys that, that, that cheat. Once my cheating trainer gets implicated for something, I'm not going to buy horses in unsafe conditions um, at two year old training sales or at yearling sales for that matter, because um, there are certain consigners that do, um, you know, medica- abuse medications or do um, unnecessary uh, um, procedures on horses to make them look sounder or, or conform better. And until 
people on this end of the equation start to dictate to people in the horse business that we're not going to take this anymore, um, it, then it's just going to continue to move on. We shouldn't have to have the FBI, for God's sake, come in and clean up our shitty mess. Yeah. But that's what's happening. And I think, you know, people that are in a position of influence, not just at the top of the game, but people like us who have a voice, um, I think there there is a, a moral obligation to speak out against this kind of stuff. And I think that there are few too many people in this industry who take it upon themselves to be cheerleaders of the game. And I think especially in the aftermath of the Santa Anita thing, I think a lot of people got very defensive and started writing op-eds about how great it is and how everybody loves their horses so much. Well, if that's the case, why are we in the position that we're in? That, to me, I think this is a time, because I, I understand the impulse, because everybody's attacking us right now. I understand the impulse to get defensive because there are a lot of great games things about the game, and we want to emphasize those things. But to me, this is a time for introspection and self-criticism and not for waving pom-poms. I think this is a time where everybody who has a voice in this industry that's listened to by anyone speaks out against this kind of stuff until it stops. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to stuff like PETA. Like, don't get me wrong, PETA has a lot of issues, and mm -hmm. we were all just... You know, they're the enemy instead of the right. things that were actually causing these problems. Well, and the horse racing wrongs guy, too. Like, right. I'm sure he's, you know, I'm sure he's got his own skeletons in the closet. But is he wrong about everything that he's saying about racing? Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't think he's right about everything. But, no. he's, you know. But to say to but we never out of hand. We don't look at we've we haven't been introspective, like you said. Of course. Yeah. And I mean it's because a lot of people collect paycheck. I mean, we collect our paychecks no, because of horse all, racing. We don't want to see horse racing go of away. Of course. We just want to see it suck a little less. <laughs> <laughs> no, and like Is that the bar? <laughs> they suck a little less? <laughs> and listen, yeah, like to your point, like I'm not washing my hands of this completely either. Like right. I bet on the sport, I cash my paycheck, you know, in a, a racing related industry. So I'm not I I feel guilty too, right. but it's, I it, you, you gotta be able to speak out and and um, really you know rip the roots out of this thing if we're going to save the sport well part of the problem though is libel laws you know it, uh, again the four of us in here i could i'd love to see each one of us come up with our top five list of the top five juicers in the country probably have a lot of names on there that would be on the same list we can't say it yeah you know and and uh you're going to get sued. You can't, and you can't come out without proof against somebody. I mean, I've mentioned three names today. Oscar Brera, he's dead. <laughs> he ain't suing me. Jason uh, Service and Jorge Navarro, who, you know, the federal government is backing me up that these guys are, are no good. Um, I'm not willing to, that's three. I'm not willing to name a four. No, of course. Yeah. How, it's how, more, how about, I think how, it's more about speaking about it uh, in a general understood. sense. Yeah. Yep. yeah. How about if we play a word association game and you tell me it Don't rhymes with, Don't go there. No, yeah. no. But how about, you know, just again, in, in Twitter sphere and, and going through that, um, you know, there's a Catherine Papp who is a vet and is a very outspoken, um, you know, individual on, on Twitter. And she's actually naming names of people that she feels mm. are, you know, are, are juicers or, are, uh, you know, mishandling the, the industry or misrepresenting the industry, and most importantly, hurting horses. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she's got a list of, I don't know, you guys can look it up. I don't want to, I don't want to campaign for it because I don't know her, but it was just interesting that she actually put in eight or 10 names. And there are a lot of other people who love the industry that are, are either echoing those sentiments or adding other people. Now, obviously, that's going to turn into a quick witch hunt, which is why I'm not going to name names on there. But, uh, you know, Bill, to your point, I think if we all, in an honest moment, wrote down five or seven names, there would be a tremendous amount of overlap. Oh, right. that's what I said. Yeah. 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 I mean, we all already know who these guys are. I mean, I might come up with, you know, my number five guy is not the same as your number five guy. But, right. You know, we, we all know. Well, especially with your history of picking crappy fillies for your top ten list. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we Jeez. know that your your list is not yeah. going to be the same as ours. We can we can pick more dead trainers, though, if you want. I'll, I'll say there's a, there's a filly on that list trained by somebody I, I'm very suspicious of. Don't just one. Ooh. Ooh. I can't wait to check that list. Yeah. A TDN exclusive. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I think back to what you, what you said, John, about the witch hunt thing. I, that's one thing that concerns me to a degree. I mean, is it every time some a trainer gets on a 10 race hot streak and they win a few races, are they going to be called out? I mean, I'm not saying most of the time they, a lot of times they don't deserve it or whatever, but it's, it's a slippery slope. I think it's more about guys that are doing it year right. over year, yeah. like service and moving horses. We're doing this year over year, allegedly. Yeah. Um, I think if you go on like a hot streak for a month or two, I don't think that counts. Right. You know, what's also interesting about the evolution of juicing when it w went back to the day I was talking about Oscar Burr and everything. And, and some of the things that started, these guys would only do it in claiming races. And, you know, I, maybe they just didn't have the, the uh, balls to try it and against better horses. Uh, maybe the horses even 
with the juice weren't good enough to do it. But you always had the feeling that like the the uh, high poobas of racing weren't going to bother with it as long as, you know, we don't care who wins the 12-5 claim or the, the $10,000 claim. Or you're now talking about, you know, guy service whose horse – Cross the finish line first in the Kentucky Derby. He was the number one rated horse in the country. You know, wins great at stakes races here and there all the time. Same thing with Navarro. You know, his record uh, with high-class horses isn't quite as good as services. But XY Jet, you know, wins in um, uh, in Dubai. Chance a lot is just this rocket ship and everything. This has gone from being something that was sort of, you know, the, the poor man's scandal to something where it is now, you know, impacting the – you know, graded race level and the best horses in the country. I think back to that day, it was a derby day. I don't remember what year when Jorge Navarro had two just absolute blowout winners. The sharp Azteca, I think Mm -hmm. was one of them. them. It was in the the other one was in the Churchill Downs race Mm -hmm. and it just didn't feel right seeing him, you know, celebrate under the twin spires. And, Mm -hmm. and those horses were both prices nowadays, you know, he'd probably get, would have gotten bet a little harder, but uh, you know, it's just weird to see things like that. And I think I, I, Similar to your point um, before about surveillance, I think racetracks also have to bear some responsibility here. Right. Um, I mean, I, I haven't mentioned them by name before, but I mean, I feel like now I can. Monmouth Park in the summer, and we love Monmouth. Monmouth is, Monmouth is the local track here. It's a beautiful track. I love going there. Basically, every horse was trained by service in Navarro, and that's why you have so few trainers there, and that's why you have such terrible betting races there, because these two guys that were allegedly juicing their horses to the moon had basically every horse and had a bunch of parade of three to five shots. And I think that the racetrack has to be, has to to take some responsibility for that. It's not just Monmouth. There's other tracks right now that they know there are cheaters on their backstretch and they don't bust them because they're filling fields. But that's exactly why, you know, Joe, we, we had horses at Monmouth park for 25 out of 26 years. And then the last two years, we've not gone to Monmouth. And part of it was we're trying to increase our, you know, betterment of our horses and we're not running as many claiming horses. And we just wanted to be able to have them with, with John service at parks where, where he's, you know, he has, um, he's King there. Um, and the other part was that I just couldn't in good conscience, bring a horse over there to know I was running for second or third place money. Mm -hmm. Um, because we just didn't want to run against a Navarro or, or a Jason service horse. Yeah. We already actually had plans to run at Monmouth this summer. Uh, my trainer, main trainer, Jason Barkley, was going to send some horses up. And we had talked about, we did a bunch of research, and we said, okay, well, we're going to avoid dirt claiming races. That's because smart. those guys just That's dominate smart. those. Yeah. And now that uh, and now that it looks like the competition is going to be a lot softer, I think we're going to ramp it up and try to f- look for more horses and actually have more of a presence there. Because, I mean, that's what happens. It drives out owners. It drives out you know, trainers who don't want to compete with these guys. So right. I think, and I think that's kind of a microcosm of what could be the positive effects of this is Monmouth right. is I think you're going to have a much better betting product this year without service and Navarro dominating everything. I think you'll have bigger fields. I think you won't have as many short price favorites. And, you know, most importantly, you're going to have owners and trainers like you guys that try to do things the right way. that are actually going to have a fighting chance to win races there. And I think that that's a good emblem for the potential positive impact of this. I, want, I wanted to mention just, just briefly the kind of the equine face of, of this indictment, which he was the only horse. Well, maximum security, too. Uh, but that was like a, that was a briefer result or a briefer recap of, of what happened with him. X, Y, Jet. There's a whole subsection of this uh, indictment that's about the doping of X, Y, Jet. And X, Y, Jet, if you don't know, he went to Dubai, ran second in the Golden Shaheen, which is one of the biggest dirt sprint races in the world. Uh, and then he went back the year the year after and won the Dubai Golden Shaheen. And he's the kind of horse that won, he would race like two to three times a year. He was clearly an unsound horse. And this was an open secret that he was trained by Jorge Navarro and Navarro would just allegedly juice him to get to this one big performance out of him. And the Dubai Golden Shaheen has a big purse and then he's good for the rest of the year. The stuff in the indictment about XY Jet is basically how he had a subpar workout and Navarro calls his connect for the drugs and says, Give me a, send me a thousand of these pills. This, this horse isn't working up to the par that I expect. And XY Jet died of a heart attack, dropped out of a heart attack in January. And I don't think there was a single person in racing who was surprised that XY Jet died under the care of Jorge Navarro. And I think that really speaks to everything, that this was a horse who had given them Everything he'd given the owners and given the trainer everything he could possibly give them, and it still wasn't enough. They still had to squeeze every ounce out of this older horse that should have been living on a farm somewhere, and now he's dead because of it. And he ain't the only one, but he is the most 
high profile example of what these trainers do to these horses. And I don't know how they sleep at night, honestly. Like it's it's it blows my mind. I guess they don't, I, they don't care, John. I guess, they don't but care. I guess I, yeah, they're sociopaths. But it's that's to, that to me, I think, is something that you should read. If you don't read anything else in this indictment, read about what they did to X Y Jet because I, th- there are a lot of horses like this, and I think that happens a lot day to day in the claiming game. Older horses that shouldn't naturally be running as fast as they still are. I mean, you see, a couple weeks ago, Georgina Baxter got busted, and not by the feds, but by the Florida regulatory body, and she got suspended 25 days. And pretty much every horse that tested positive was 11 years old, 8 years old, 7 years old. She had a horse named Faction Cat, who was a 7-year-old, who set a course record at Tampa Bay a couple of weeks ago, ran five furlongs and 53 and change. This is the this is this is the like unreported part of this, and if you don't know racing, this is the, this is what you should look at: is that these older horses are the squeezing a lemon dry, and it's not it's not right. It's it's an awful thing, and I just I thought we should mention that because X Y Jet deserves so so, so all these horses do, but especially X Y Jet who had given so much to these people deserves so much better, and they don't care. They don't care. All they care about is the money, and if the horse drops dead, they could care less. This week's news is sponsored by West Point Thoroughbreds. Owning a multiple graded stakes winning racehorse like Hard Not to Love is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit our website, westpointtb.com. So mentioned in that copy is Hard Not to Love, who will be running this weekend in the grade one beholder mile at Santa Anita stretching out to two turns for the first time looking for her third straight graded stakes win obviously a very exciting filly we talked about her before and how she might be the leader in the distaff division when everything is said and done uh they also have Chestertown who is lining up in the million dollar Louisiana Derby with John Velasquez coming in to ride and they'll be at the OBS March sales they bought the OBS March topper Chestertown um they'll be back there next week and Brian DiDonato will be there as well you going to be bidding against West Point at all? I don't know. I might be wearing a, a mask. Just, you, you, of... you guys might be two of the only end users there, the way the uh, the, the coronavirus That's is true. spreading. It sounds like, I mean, they're, you know, talking about OBS, they're going to have the sale. It sounds like it's yeah. going to be, most people are going to, it's tough to just miss a sale if you're, obviously, if you're a consigner, if you're a buyer. So I think it'll, there should be a decent turnout. Best of luck to them with Hard Not to Love. Very exciting. And, and Chestertown as well. Uh, we like to see friends of the show do well, and uh, we always appreciate their sponsorship. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With more than 500 clients in the horse business, they were bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is Tom Morley, Morley Racing. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. Of course, and I've, you've been pretty outspoken about this week's news on Twitter. That's why we wanted to have you on. But specifically why I wanted to have you on, you're a young up and coming trainer, I think, and a guy that's still establishing himself in the game. So my question to you is, you know, as one as one of those people, without naming any names or getting into the specifics of the indictment, I want to know what it's like as a younger trainer in a competitive business, what it's like to lose market share and sometimes in some cases horses directly to people that you know are not playing by the rules. Um, honestly, Joe, it's heartbreaking. Um the news that came out the day before you oh, on Monday was um, not really a shock to me when it happened, but at the same time, it, the timing of it was. Uh, obviously, we didn't had no idea about what about the federal investigation that was going on, but um, to wake up to to friends and, and text messages saying that with the um, federal investigator cars all over the Palm Meadows and apparently called her and. Numerous other establishments really rocked the the industry as a whole. But from a personal point of view, you feel incredibly cheated. Um, You know, I'm 36 years old. I've been in this country for eight years. I've had a trainer's license since 2013. And New York is a very tough place to do business as it is. Um, You know, you've got to go up against powerhouse stables. And you're trying to make a name for yourself here. And, um, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job so far. We've won a couple of grade ones. And, 
you're trying to get your feet under the table in a big, like at, at a big table, um, like Belmont and Saratoga, the Naira circuit, etc. And um, to be to be being beaten by people that are being prosecuted by the feds for uh, doping horses and cheating is it's heartbreaking for me and my young family. You know, it's hard enough to do business as it is here, let alone to know that we've been running against people who aren't playing by the rules. Tom, Brad, Dinato, how are you? Hey, how are we doing? Good. Um, so one thing we were talking about before we had John was uh, just trainer win percentages. And uh, obviously this is a tough thing to you know answer concretely, but what would you say is maybe a natural fair win percentage for a trainer to have? And I know this is kind of a slippery slope, but what would you say? So this is, a, I think this has got a, a number of different question marks over it um, because I I am not somebody who pays particular attention to his win percentage for the simple reason I actually use racing to develop horses. You'll you'll see that I have a very low win percentage first time out, normally because I want my horses to have a run first time. Go to the races, have an enjoyable experience, come back a wiser, stronger individual, and then go on into their career. Um, grass horses coming back off a layoff. I give virtually all of my New York bred turf horses the winter off. Very often they need a, a run when they come back. Um, before they're fully, fully tightened up. Um, I think probably if you look at Hall of Famers like Shug McGahey and, and, and Bill Mott, you know, they're in the in and around the 15% win percentage. And then you've got guys with enormous numbers of horses who can probably eke that number up to about the 20% purely because when it's time to win a race with a horse and potentially the, the owner group, ownership group has no interest of of keeping a horse who may be competitive in high level claimers, but they're really striving to compete on the state circuit. They can go to places like Saratoga and say, instead of running Norman as a three for 40, we're going to run Norman as a three for 25 horses, two to five gets the job done. And so those guys have a little bit of an advantage that they can probably push that percentage up to around 20. Um, you know, I think when you're looking at winning races, one in every three races that you take part in, that, that's an extremely difficult thing to do. Tom, it, it's John Green from DJ Sable. Thanks so much for, for uh, coming on. We greatly appreciate Hi, it. Um, thank you again. Um, so as an owner, um, you know, it, 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 it shocks and, and just, you know, shook me to the core of everything that was going on on, on Monday with the FBI indictments. Um, but in, in reading you know, on Twitter and, and going down that rabbit hole, which is, which is probably something I shouldn't do. But, you know, one of the things that, that, that comes up that, that, that the general public um, would question is how much information did the owners really have that this was going on? And, and, and I guess the question I have for you is when you talk to your owners about some of the procedures and things that you do with your horses, um, you know, are they, are they understanding, are they knowing of all of the things that you're doing? And again, this isn't, I'm not trying to, to implement you, implicate you, excuse me, in anything, you know, nefarious. Sure. I'm just saying, you know, how, how much should the owners know um, about what is being done to their horses? Because there's talk out there that if, you know, if, if the trainers uh, end up getting implicated for some of these issues, that the owners should also lose their licenses. And, and I guess that's really the question to you is, you know, do you think that would be a, a fair, um, a fair? I, I, I think that's a, t a, John, it's a super question to ask, but, and I think it's a, it's a very much a two part answer. Um, some of my, uh, I, and I'm talking purely from a personal point of view here, literally two days ago, I went through a vet bill with an owner. He just had some inquiries about what certain things on the vet bill were. Um, and, I always try and say to people who have horses with us, and so I, I'm speaking from a personal point of view, that you have to remember that these are not my horses. I don't own them. I haven't paid for them. I haven't bred them. And I send them. A, I send the owners a bill at the end of the month. And I very much try and, you know, advocate the fact that if you want to know something about what's happening with your horse, please ask me because there will be a logical answer now. That's that's me, um, and so I'm I'm answering that from a personal point of view. Do I think that um, some of these owner group ownership groups need to be punished when their horse returns a positive test, etc.? That's a very grey area for me. Um, you know, I think uh, there's been it's been very well published that a certain Californian owner has been um, has been recorded on um, on the telephone with Navarro regarding a. a, a the, giving the horse pills or something, something along those lines. That owner was quite clearly 
aware of what was going on with his thoughts. Should he face sanctions? In my opinion, absolutely. Absolutely no doubt at all. If he was aware, um, and he should be part of the investigation as well. But, um, you know, to, to I, I'm also in a little bit of an easier position that we train around 30 horses. It's very easy for me to keep my owners abreast of what's going on, on with the horses day to day. Um, you know, if we have a lameness issue or a soundness issue, if we need to, um, you know, if we need a veterinary exam, a chiropractic exam, it's very, you know, I do. It's easy for me to communicate with the owners um, about everything that's going on day to day in the shed row. But I think it's a little bit of a murky area of how far the owners can be taken into account for this, because some of them almost certainly didn't know what was going on with their horses. Um, you know, it's, there are a lot of people out there who look very foolish on, as you said, the rabbit hole of social media where, you know, a lot of people have defended Jason Service and said that he's got these fantastic different training techniques and um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, very sadly, we are now, the, the truth is coming out about this, um, this fact. But, um, you know, I don't want to say too much about it because I, 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 it, it's a very difficult question to answer but i do firmly believe that owners should be privy to any information that they want about their horses at the end of the day john they're their horses um and and so any owners shouldn't be shy about inquiring into anything they question that's going on with their racehorses Right. No, I think that's an excellent point. And, and just as a follow up to you, uh, again, as, as a trainer who's who is interviewed by potential owners, um, you know, to, to take over horses, n nobody when you ask a trainer, um, you know, what do you do to improve a horse? Nobody's going to say, I, I juice the horse or I use X, Y, Z medication or or I'm doing these things. What are some of the questions that owners should be asking trainers that would give them an idea of, um, you know, exactly what the trainer's um, training schedule and regimen is just so that way, again, they can kind of figure out who the, who the good guys and the bad guys are. <clears throat> Great question. Very difficult to answer. Um, I'm a huge believer in chiropractic and acupuncture work. Uh, I believe that the equine form is in its correct alignment that the horse will be able to train um as as hard and as aggressively as you need it to um i think that everyone has their own training techniques and and um there you know the, there is a a very large variation of of people who do things different ways out there but i think when you've got consistent um across the board it's a difficult one, John. In the, I think we're looking at a case of, of two guys here, and um, we're probably going to get onto this later. That, that do I think that this is the end of this? Absolutely not. I really do not believe that this is the end of it. I think we're scratching the surface of something here, and this could go an awful lot further than I expect it to. Um, the, um, I think you've got to be able to look a man in the eye and genuinely believe him when you're interviewing him about about um, having his ho your horses with him. Um, and, you know, there are, there are the, those of us who are out there are very vocal about these things as well. Um, I think it's very important that as an industry, especially as a horseman's group, that we get behind this investigation because those of us who do do it properly want these guys out. We do not want to compete against them day in, day out. Tom, uh, I'm guessing you haven't, you didn't, probably have never claimed a horse off of Jason Service or Jorge Navarro, but uh, can you talk a little bit about horses you've had experience with who maybe you've got from another trainer you saw and, you know, maybe you had your suspicions or on the flip side, horses that maybe you had at one point who were subsequently claimed and maybe you saw improvement, uh, anything you've kind of noticed from that? So it's a really, really, that's a, a great question and I'm going to give you a very, very frustrating answer. <laughs> I have claimed one horse off Jason Service. It ran first time back for me, ran exactly the same number as it did the day that I claimed it off Jason and got claimed away from me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the one example of that that I can give you. Um, have I seen a number of my horses go on and improve dramatically? Um, uh, Glorious Empire springs to mind, but that was down to a fantastic piece of management of exercise-induced pulmon pul pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, he's the only horse who's gone on and well, I, the thing about claiming claiming races is 
I I never want to see a horse of mine leave the barn and its form tail off horribly. You know, it, it's important that people think that you're running sound horses who they can maintain and have the same sort of pleasure that they that they've given us. It's all about trying to win a race. You're putting the horse in the in a, a spot that it can be competitive in, uh, where you value the horse. Um, you try never to undervalue a horse. Um, I do always say that when you cross the Verrazano for Saratoga, your horse's value seems to, di- seems to become half what it was when we left Belmont. Um, and then when we come back in September, the horse who was worth 40 in June was still he's, he's worth 40 again, but he was only worth 25 when we went up to Saratoga. But that's because everyone wants to win up there. Um, so have I seen any horses dramatically improve under suspicious circumstances having been claimed from me? I think the first horse that Jason had, ever claimed off me was in on friday um i was intrigued to see how the horse was mm-hmm. gonna run um <laughs> and no, i'm now not, <laughs> now not gonna see how that horse got to, is gonna run um so I, I i'm afraid guys i'm not able to give you a particularly um thoughtful answer on that one um you know i don't compete on the florida circuit so it kind of rule takes me out of the the navarro equation um but, you know, Monmouth Park is now very much more open to the rest of us as a, as a racing jurisdiction than it was um, in, in years past as well. So Absolutely. Yeah, we were talking about that. Now, uh, kind of a, I guess, sort of a similar question. Uh, there's been talk, you know, for there's a lot of pressure now on the next trainer who's going to get some of these horses that have been transferred from these guys. Uh, what would your take if, you know, if somebody called you up tomorrow and said, hey, uh, we want to send you ten horses that were trained by Jorge Navarro. Um, I would the, categorically, the... I would categorically not take those horses. Mm-hmm. I have picked up one filly from Michael Tinizzo. Uh, Tinizzo was not indicted for giving his horses illegal medication. Um, it looks like he has been caught up in a very, very bad situation, where possibly where he wasn't um, wasn't actually giving the medication to himself. He was acting as a courier. And uh, look, I, it's this is not down to me to speculate, but I have picked up one horse from him. But mm. if somebody rang me and asked me to take ten horses from Jorge Navarro, the answer would be no. Okay, uh, this is a two part question that I had, just because you have European experience. Um, the first part is when you came to America and started training here, was there any kind of culture shock into how permitted drugs were? And the second part is what do you think? Because American racing, I think, especially American dirt racing, has a very negative uh, reputation around the world. What do you think, if anything, this will do to that reputation? Now, that is a can of worms, if ever you've ever put it. Um, that, that is our job, though, Tom. <laughs> did the medication policies when I came to America shock me? Uh, no, I was aware of them. Um, I'd been here 10 years previously, um, for, spent a little bit of time with Owen Harty. And um, honestly, since then to when I moved to America, we'd taken an enormous stride forward uh, in terms of the medication that we were allowed to give horses and the withdrawal periods going into a race. So I felt that we were going in the right direction when I came here. Um, And since I've been here, we've taken massive strides forward and we're taking bigger and bigger strides forward again. But I'm talking about permissible, uh, permissible medication and withdrawal times going into races. I am not talking about performance enhancing drugs, et cetera. I remember when I arrived in America, clenbuterol was a seven day withdrawal. Um, it is 14 in most jurisdictions. I uh, strongly believe that Mark Cassie is completely correct in what he wrote in the T, I believe it was a, uh, the TDN yeah. that um, he said we need to be 30 days. I think that's absolutely correct. The anti-inflammatory rules are very much going in the right direction. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that the 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 policies that are being put into place on the on the west coast at the I'm oh, sorry, on the east coast at the moment um, are good. They're really, really good, and we're getting better and better. And I, but and and I think that we're we're moving in the right direction um, on basically all forms of medication. Now, uh, Lasix is a little bit of a difficult one because. I actually believe that Lasix is um, a medication that we can definitely do without. But I also believe that we can we we need to tailor other medication policies in front of Lasix before we get to the Lasix idea. I'm running a filly on Friday. On Saturday, she will run with no Lasix in a dirt race. 
uh, to her first time running. I'm running a horse on Sunday. He will run with no Lasix. We are not having any Lasix in two-year-old races. Does the idea of Lasix being phased out of American racing scare me? Absolutely not. I couldn't be more delighted about the fact. Is it going to affect certain horses? Yes. Is it going to mean that those horses get extended periods of time off? Yes. Is it going to mean some horses are retired and need to find new careers? Yes. Is that good for the thoroughbred breed in North America? Yes. Um, but I do think that we need to carry on with the anti-inflammatories. I think we need to carry on with the, uh, addressing the clenbuterol question. Um, and why do we have a bad perception um, for our racing in North America? Because if you're a European and you come to run out here, uh, you are used to a certain set of rules. And those those rules are very, very different when you get on the plane to come over here. Um, you know, the idea in England of being able to give a shot of butte at 48 hours before a race and then give five cc's of Lasix on the day of a race. Those are, those are you know, those are two powerful drugs um, that are allowed one on race day and one within four, one up to 48 hours out from a race in, in, the, uh, in the state of New York or virtually everywhere in America. And now um, I think that is just the general perception. Now, what happened on Monday is a bloody nose, a black eye, and we lost four teeth in a fist fight <laughs> with, our, with, trying to, with trying to improve our perception across the world. Um, anyone who says that horses need Lasix and medication to race on dirt, well, they don't need it in Japan. They don't need it. There's plenty of dirt racing everywhere else on the face of the earth where they don't race with these medications. So I think the fact that we are gently moving away and uh, some people would say, are, are we doing it too slowly? I think we're doing it at a rate that uh, as probably as fast as we can realistically. Um, and and so I applaud the powers that be of the progress we're making, to be honest. Taking out the trash is what I would call it. Um, yeah. I, I had one more question for you. Um, I think you have an interesting perspective on this. Uh, for those people that don't know, your wife is Maggie Wolfendale, who does a great job on the Naira broadcast and the Fox Sports broadcast. This is a navel gazing question, but we in the media, I feel like have had a lot of issues with having to pretend that these guys were on the up and up this whole time. Has she ever expressed, I mean, you might not, you might not feel comfortable talking for her, but has she ever expressed that kind of frustration having to interview these guys and act like everything was okay? That's a, that's a very tough question for me to answer. Cause I try, I try and leave Maggie's in my personal relationship. Totally fine. Behind, no, that's totally fine. If but, that's the case behind closed doors. But, um, you know, in hindsight, in hindsight, I would imagine that on Monday evening, uh, Maggie probably looked back at um, Jason Service standing in the winner's circle after maximum security won at Belmont here, and she was interviewing him, and he was in floods of tears. That must be enormously frustrating for somebody like my wife. who yeah. uh, she, Was she interviewing the wrong man? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes, she was. Um, is it something that we speak about? Not very much. We try, you know... We try to we try to leave work at the front door. Um, otherwise, this industry can be all consuming. But obviously, we talk about these things. And and but in a broader spectrum, I think it's very difficult for those in the media to put these people on a pedestal when, in the back of everyone's minds, there are major major question marks about. Um, their methods and practices. Absolutely. hundred percent. Right. Tom, we can't thank you enough for joining us and for all the insights and, and we appreciate you speaking up as well on social media and such. And uh, thanks for being on with us. Well, thank you all for having me. Thanks. Absolutely. Tom. Wonderful thanks, job. Thank you. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, Tom Morley will receive a free one-hour tax consultation, The Green Group, bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. The TDN Riders Room is presented by Keeneland, the home of world-class racing and industry-leading sales. The spring race meet begins Thursday, April 2nd, and Keeneland's next auction is the April 2-year-olds in training and horses of racing age sale directly after opening weekend on April 7th. The 2-year-old catalog for the April sale is now available online. So I want to thank everybody who contributed to this week's Riders Room. Obviously a very a seismic week in horse racing, and there's going to be a lot of fallout to discuss going forward. I want to thank Bill Finley, who's done a great job reporting on this all week. John Green, Brian DiDonato, our producer, Patty Wolf and our editor, Nathan Wilkinson. We will see you next week.